All right, welcome. Welcome back. I mean, today is a special day for me because I am get to, to talk to Sue Lamb, uh, formerly of Shell, now the people analytics leader at the Coca-Cola company. Uh, she has had a very influential career in people analytics, culture, people strategy. So she's going to share her perspectives and ideas on what's going on with people analytics and actually making it happen. And of course, Phil Wilburn, who leads people analytics there at Workday. Hey, welcome. Thanks for being here. How are you two doing? Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'll always, always look forward to this. Hey, I mean, I'm really, really excited. I say that a lot, but you know, there is a lot of buzz around the acquisition of Pecan, uh, what you all are doing with people analytics. I know it's been a long journey for all of us in this discipline, but certainly as Workday has great, uh, created prominence and it becomes pervasive in many industries, it's like, okay, what do we do with all this data? So you all have practical, yeah, experience in leveraging not only Workday, but the adjacent processes to actually get this insight into the right people at the right time to take appropriate action. So very excited for this morning's discussion. So with that, I'm going to leave it to you and uh, have some fun and I'll come back in uh, what about 25 minutes or so. All right, Sue. Thanks for uh, <laughs> joining me on this and thanks for allowing me to, to reach out and uh, uh, help I guess to digest a little bit of what happened in people analytics over the last two years. And I'm super excited for this conversation. And I think it's gonna be so helpful for our other people analytics leaders out there who have, you know, faced what we've faced. Um, and uh, just again, uh, appreciate you being on uh, with us here today. Let's, um, you know, it, uh, it's not a, a, a workday related presentation if I don't share our safe harbor statement, which is, um, all about making, uh, if we make future oriented um, statements to, to understand the current products and its capabilities. Since Sue and I are both practitioners, we're pretty grounded about what it can do. So I don't have to worry too much about that. However, I do get pretty excited. And so sometimes I overly excited and, and say, product, I wish you could do this. So again, uh, Sue, so happy that you can join us here today, uh, I think we're gonna have a, a great discussion. I um, I loved all of our pre-discussions and I thought, wow, you know, this is a, a topic that's so relevant and so, um, um, so personal for our people analytics leaders. If we don't help unpack it for them, I think um, they can lose some lessons along the way. So let's just, let's just jump in here. Um, so today, um, we're going to uh, set up a, a great uh, a conversation for you. And um, back to in preparation for, for the session, uh, Sue and I spent some time reflecting uh, the last year about the on the last year and a half of our work. Uh, we realized we both felt this big pull towards the center of decision making during uh, the, the time this time that really elevated the visibility uh, of people analytics, but also played a central role in so many of the decisions that we're making. Uh, and dur during this, we both uh, saw the need for scale of our and our orgs asked us to do this to make bigger impact. And today we're gonna share two specific stories and some lessons we learned during this journey. Uh, we are both at different stages in our journey and you'll hear that between uh, where we're at. Um, but so we'll share our own lesson learned from this experience and hopefully, you know, the audience, you who are who are in people analytics, you're an analyst, you're you're leading operations or you're considering about standing up a team. You're going to garner some insights through this conversation. So first, I'm going to start with some context set, context setting. What is this uh, journey that we've been on? This is <laughs> what I'm calling the we thought it was the 2020 uh, journey, but it is the 2020 and beyond impact. Uh, we only wish that had been 2020, but the uncertainty of 2021 is proving to be uh, as fun, I don't know if that's the right term, um, as chaotic as 2020. So let's reflect just a bit on how we got here. So 2020 did change us, um, and we did live through uh, massive changes kind of in society and in, th in throughout the organizations. A couple of key points. 
we went home. Uh, employees have never been more physically disconnected from work. Um, we have seen that boundaries dissolved between work and life balance. For example, at Workday, we saw 99% of our employees go remote. We also transformed. We saw many industries transforming, including retail, healthcare, entertainment, and more. That's a sparked acute competition for talent. And as economies have restarted, we're beginning to see turnover, mass, you know, a number of turnover and tons of hiring. And even though productivity increased during this time, we also saw an increase in fatigue, burnout. You know, we are seeing uh, our employees, uh, even at workday, feeling 50% less connected um, currently than they were prior to the pandemic. Pandemic, And then we became more aware with social justice movement and social unrest in general, there's been a more corporate attention to inequality, diversity, and inclusion. It's even hotter in the, in the, uh, in the boardroom, in the C-suite. And that's something that people analytic leaders across the spectrum have had to uh, respond to. And so we were, we were, that was 2020. And then we were racing into what we were hoping was, would be the next normal. And it probably is the next normal. So coming out of 2020, we are making plans to develop, create the next nor new normal. Yes. How are we going to make hybrid work? Uh, more importantly, what does that even mean? And are we okay with this hybrid work? Business was changing dramatically at Workday. We were doing entire sales cycles plus implementations fully virtual. How did we, we needed to support uh, our workforce to ensure they weren't burning out during this time. And in the midst of this, like many other companies, we double our efforts around valuing inclusion, belonging, equity for all. So that's what we are racing into. But then we hit kind of this roadblock. And it, you know, I wouldn't call it a roadblock, but but kind of a surprise in 2021 that there's so many employees um, during this time um, who were reflecting on their careers and wanted something different. And so this great resignation resignation was coming up. So 40% of employees were thinking about learning. We've seen attrition spike across the, the board. We've were the Adam Grant called this kind of the 21, 2021, the state of languishing. And even our own internal analysis of our PECON uh, report of hundreds of thousands of um, employee sentiment data, we saw that employees wanted something dramatically different in 2021, flexibility, inclusivity, and still continued uh, career pro progression. So you're like, okay, Phil, I get this. I know the context. Where are you going? Here's where I'm going. I'm going <laughs> to just make this very actionable. People analytics played a central role in every one of these initiatives. And I just spent a little bit of time reflecting on the key things that I was involved in personally and our teams were involved in from making decisions of remote work and remote work policies, productivity, managing burnout, well-being, location changes, location strategy, uh, vaccines, workforce planning, hiring, forecasting, onboarding, uh, internal mobility. And we didn't just play small roles in this. And I know, Sue, you, many of this resonates with you as well. Uh, people have played a large role in, in informing decisions and actions that come from this. So again, back to this idea that People Analytics has really been elevated in its visibility and the organization has asked a lot more from us. So we are much more visible and many more central because of what's happened over the last year and a half. And, and the organization asks, hey, you're doing great work, but how do we scale your impact? And that's really the journey that we wanted to share with you today is, you know, given this context, given this, how central we are, what are the two, what are a couple of ways, you know, that um, uh, again, Sue is, has taken on and I have taken on to really scale our organizations. So in the context of this, and we're going to pivot and start to tell uh, um, uh, our stories, I'm going to bring Sue back in to the conversation as she kind of talks about how did she, you know, she had a couple of things, not only the context of the last uh, two years, but also starting a new position and uh, trying to elevate what you're doing there. So Sue, why don't you jump in and kind of walk us through a little bit about your journey during this entire time? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Phil. Uh, next slide, please. 
So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, before I share some of the work that we've been doing, here's just a quick view of our networked people analytics team in the Coca-Cola company. Um, and shameless plug, I'll be posting for a people analytics manager or director role in the near future. So please reach out if you might be interested in chatting. Um, next slide, please. So as Phil mentioned, most of us saw a forced digital acceleration and Coke definitely experienced the same. Um, so some short historical context. Um, so Coke has historically been an in-person or what I call an in-person culture. So we're working side by side with the communities in which it serves. We have operations in over 200 countries and operations can range anywhere from being very local to very global. So complete true story. Um, I was climbing Mount Fuji over a decade and a half ago. And while I was struggling with the climb, this older gentleman had, he literally had some Coke products strapped to his back and he was carrying them up, you know, next to the mountain hut, uh, next mountain hut with no problem while I was huffing and puffing. So that's just an example of how local we typically operate. Um, but as you can imagine, in the past, Coke used to be very decentralized. So every business unit would have its own HR, finance, procurement, marketing, etc. And you can probably see how this can be really costly across all the geographies. Um, but in reality, some of the work needs to continue to be decentralized to meet the local market needs, um, but much of it can also be centralized due to the global nature of our business. So for example, um, some marketing campaigns might make sense globally, so those initiatives can actually share costs. Um, so several years back, some of you may have remembered this, but we had a share a Coke campaign where the names of people were printed on the bottles of Coke. Um, and the campaign was rolled out in many different geographies. And um, in the future, rather than having each business unit run their own campaign, we could centralize efforts in areas that made sense for the campaign and then localize things like the names of people on bottles. So during the pandemic, we moved from being very decentralized, like in my examples, to then centralizing work that can be scalable. Now, this may totally sound like common practice for most companies that you're all in, um, but in Coke, being decentralized help us to meet our customers' needs. So you can imagine how big of a culture change this was, especially during the pandemic. Um, and as you can imagine with all the culture and behavior change, data and digital are one of our enterprise capabilities needed across the entire company to help us understand whether we're actually making the behavioral and cultural changes we need and then also where we might need to improve. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk a few about a few projects that we've been doing in Coke over the last year or so. Um, so in uh, in the last year or so, we've used people analytics in a couple of different ways, um, especially during the pandemic. And as I mentioned, data and digital were things that were helping us lead the way. Um, I think Phil had mentioned this as well, but Coke is actually at the beginning of the people analytics journey. And so I do think that more will come even after the pandemic. Um, so first, you'll see on the very left, augmented insights with tools. Um, we're starting to use more products to help in our digital acceleration. And I, I think a lot of people can really understand this because they've probably been on the same journey. But our people analytics team has traditionally worked only with our executive leadership team. And we provided like white glove support for everything from reporting simple operational reports all the way to advanced analytics. Now with rapid changes in the business and also growing interest in using data to make people decisions, um, we need to use technology to take some of that burden off of our team. You know, we can't hold everybody's hand, but actually still make impact. Um, and so to help target this need, we first built a Power BI dashboard to answer some questions such as, how are we doing on diversity and equity and inclusion of our internal employees? You know, how might that differ across job grades? Um, what might drive engagement of uh, people in different groups? And so this has been really useful for our HR business partners, uh, but we obviously want to automate some of that work so we can refocus some of our efforts to other important projects that come up, uh, like some of the future of work topics that Phil had mentioned, but also still provide data to the business to make evidence-based HR decisions. 
So to target this need, um, we're about to launch Workday People Analytics, which is kind of like an HR analyst tool that provides users with information like DE&I, um, retention, attrition, um, things like that. And so we're actually finalizing testing right now and we'll roll out in a month. Um, but initial feedback from our testers who are mostly HR business partners, um, it's been positive and they're hoping to get more insights in the future. So they're already like, when can we have more? I'm like, hold your horses, like we gotta get there. Um, but we're also working with Workday Prism to target other analytics needs. Um, so I think a lot of you might know about it, but it's a tool that kind of acts like a hub um, for multiple data sets and systems. And we're seeing if we can move most, if not all of our um, dashboard work into Prism so that we can help to automate that so we can then refocus our efforts. Um, so we obviously are increasing our use of people analytics related projects internally. Um, so we do also have some employees who act as product managers. And I anticipate that these roles are going to be here to stay and will likely grow with the addition of other products. Um, if you ask me whether we would have product managers like 10 years ago in people analytics, I don't know, call me old school or something like that. But I've been like, what the heck is a product manager for people analytics? Um, so there's that. Um, but in the second example, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, what we call performance enablement or um, a lot of folks call pre um, performance management. So we did away with traditional performance reviews as we moved to this more networked way of working. So traditional performance reviews, um, they worked really well when we were hierarchical. Um, but if you're inputting into projects across the business, um, you probably want feedback from a lot of different people. And so we started with 360 evaluations to provide performance feedbacks to our employees. Um, and we recently updated it with our new leadership behaviors. So um, our raters can provide feedback on, you know, multiples of people on how you're delivering work in addition to how you're getting the work done. So we allow for things like your direct line manager to give feedback, uh, your functional manager, project manager, um, peers, and also direct reports if you have a team. And so that's something else that we've put into place um, over the last few years to help address some of the needs that we've had. Um, third, I think everybody has been talking about this and Phil had mentioned it as well, but everyone's been talking about Zoom fatigue and being overloaded with like meetings and emails, chats and calls and things like that. Um, I think Rob Cross and RJ Milner and Associates just recently released um, an HBR article on this very topic. And I think Phil might also talk about this a bit. Um, but we've conducted some internal research on this topic this year um, to primarily help with workload, um, but to also help us understand whether our reorg is helping people um, to collaborate with um, more folks and the right folks. Um, and then lastly, before Delta, um, we were actually working with um, our workplace or our real estate folks to understand which teams should be prioritized for returning to the office when we thought we were going to return to the office, um, and also which teams should be uh, seated near one another because they collaborate much more. Um, so in the Cook campus in Atlanta, we're in many different buildings. The campus is pretty big. So we want to seat people uh, near each other if they're collaborating more, just so they don't have to run back and forth to offices um, you know, that are very far away. So um, we worked with them on that, but they also wanted to understand whether um, it would be useful to have a satellite location for folks who might like live um, in the suburbs further away from the main office, but people who would still benefit from an office space. Um, so we're working with them on that. And we're also working with them to help understand like how much CO2 savings we'd have if we have employees at either flexible work locations or also working from home. And so these are just, um, uh, you know, some very brief snippets of projects that we're doing at the moment um, on the future of work topic. I'm happy to chat in um, further detail if you have questions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so uh, lots of lessons have been learned throughout my career, but also at Coca-Cola and doing all of these projects. Um, so the first is, it takes a ton of money to fund people analytics teams. And some companies may not fully understand the importance of analytics. Like people might just say, well, I can do that in Excel or, you know, what are you telling me that's over and above what I already know? 
Um, and so I always recommend start with a small project and create pull from the business because it's better for change management. And then people will understand its value because they've seen it work. Um, and so this is something that I always recommend doing. Um, that also goes to my second lesson learned. Um, if you don't create the pull for your work, the push could make adoption by the business come a lot later. Um, and I've experienced this as well. So for successful change management, starting small and creating the pull for your work makes change a whole lot easier. Um, otherwise, change could come much, much later. Um, and then last but not least, I know the Matrix 4 um, movie is going to come out soon. Um, so some of you may have seen that, you know, back in the day in the theaters. Um, but the method of communication and the output of people analytics really matters. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm totally drawn to charts and graphs that look nice. Um, even if I'm not able to make them myself, you can totally see in our slides today. <laughs> Um, definitely. Um, and so what I found is that if, you know, my presentation looks bad or is too complicated or wordy, people just won't pay attention. You know, they'll totally turn off because there's so much going on in the world right now. You know, it, there's just too much. Um, so spend the time to make your deliverable look good so people will pay attention. So we recently brought in an MBA summer intern to help our analytics team with marketing our work more efficiently so that people would take action from the insights. Um, as demand for our time and attention increases, the storytelling piece um, is really critical to creating change in the company. So shifting from the more academic focus um, to business impact is also important. Um, you know, make sure your stakeholders know what's in it for them and that your work is digestible, um, is straightforward and simple. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Phil. Thanks, Sue. I think one of the things before we jump into this uh, that I'm struck by, Sue, is, is two things. This idea of augmenting what you can and automating it so you can elevate the impact of your work with, you know, limited resources, really. And the second one, which is about making the insight so consumable. And so I would say usable that you create this pool for the organization. I guess one question is how did, how did you go about, or what was the insight that drove you and your team to really focus on the usability of those insights? I, I don't think there, there was any like one insight that drove that, um, but it was essentially at Coke, it seemed like when we came with uh, one insight. So for example, um, we found that employee engagement um, drives business performance. So our business units uh, had better performance um, if they had better leaders and better engagement. And so as we started releasing um, insight by insight, people were like, well, you know, can I look at that in a dashboard? Can I see what that looks like in my business unit? And so basically every single time we kind of presented a new insight, there was just more pull. And we thought, oh gosh, we are not able to keep up with this demand unless we automate some of this. And so we got to automate all the stuff that we've already worked on. And so people get those insights. So then we can move on to, you know, new topics. So not any one specific insight. It's just that every single one just drove more ask. Yeah. I, it's almost as if it's a survival mechanism. If it we're going to continue, <laughs> for, <laughs> if we're going to continue to provide value, we need to find, we, we need to find methods to scale. And I, I think that it tees up really nicely of what we've been doing here at Workday and kind of our journey. And if I could start by framing up kind of maybe, uh, let's call it a philosophical uh, um, perspective on this shift, we're actually seeing a big shift in people analytics right now from what I'm calling a very service oriented function to product oriented function. And Sue, I, I definitely saw that in, in, in your journey of where you're at. And what this means is we are pivoting away from everything being white glove, one off bits of analysis to scalable insights distributed to the edges that are automated for the entire organization. But that requires people analytics leaders and teams to think fundamentally differently about how they use data and where technology fits in there. And when you get to that point, you're able 
to really scale these insights and touch many more leaders, managers, and even first-line employees uh, across the organization. So I think there's a big shift going on, and um, this is going to accelerate as we go through um, you know, this 2020 <laughs> impact journey for sure. And for our own um, particular journey, we actually started and it started the team a number of years ago, um, focusing on personas. We felt that a persona-based analytics uh, um, strategy was one way that we are going to get scale in our organization. And this is just an example of how we've looked across the, the life cycle of our business and our major stakeholders from our SVPs and VPs, the most senior leaders, to those people who support those senior leaders, our HR partners, our belonging diversity partners, our talent acquisition partners, um, to the people who run the business, our directors, to our uh, frontline um, people managers who need access to employee sentiment engagement data and even to our individual contributors. So we took this uh, perspective where we looked at these personas and we said, what are the analytical products that we could create and scale across these personas and focus on supporting them? And that's been our uh, focus the past two and a half, three years is to really scale and really iterate and make impact on these products. And we actually have a kind of a mantra or philosophy about what, re what we do in people analytics at Workday in order to make these kind of products really, really impactful. And it's three specific things. One, we take the, I would say, creativity and innovation from our data science and research team. They're always looking at forward-looking information. They're always doing some wild, crazy analysis about what's going to happen now and what's potentially happen in the future. And then we take that and then we build it in and ensure that it becomes relevant. And by relevant means, we partner with the business so that the insights are just like some you know, a researcher going off and say, this is interesting. It's actually business oriented. It's relevant. It becomes personalized. And that way it's actually actionable. And lastly, and, and you hit on this a bit, uh, Sue, in your um, um, presentation, which is you need to make it usable. Um, focusing on usability is so important because the attention that our leaders and our managers have nowadays, space to consume data and they take actions is getting smaller and smaller. So you need to meet them where they're at. You need to have stories that are relevant to your data. You need to have the data clear and compelling and insightful. You need to have actions associated with that data. So we feel strongly that we are in the action business, the usability business. So we go across the, that spectrum across there. So maybe just to ground it in uh, a couple of perspectives, I'm just going to share a couple of, of uh, I would maybe call them products that we've uh, generated during this time um, to really help um, drive some of the strategic initiatives. And I will start with Zoom fatigue, uh, which is what Sue and I were talking about. Um, how do you make uh, insights usable and relevant? Um, one of the things that we did it to, to um, address the issue of Zoom fatigue, and it's a good issue to think about because um, the, the first question is, is it a real thing? Um, I think we pretty much answered it, but then who is it impacting most? And what we found is that it was impacting across the organization, but especially our management population. And so we did some research. We took all the Zoom data during the entire uh, uh, pandemic, uh, and we looked at um, people's perception of how effective their Zoom meetings were pr previous to before. Um, and we looked for improvement. And we look for improvement and we found this very special number. We found that the difference between people who are experiencing Zoom fatigue and those who really weren't was two to three hours uh, a week difference compared to their peers. So if you were compared to your peers uh, on Zoom two to three more hours a week, you were more likely to be experiencing that. So that's good. We found the research. What we ended up doing is creating this nice infographic to tell the story of it. But not only that, we created specific tools and strategies to help our, our leaders, our managers, and employees deal with that. Not only that, we made it into a uh, augmented tool. So not only do we have this, this story here, but we also have a tool that managers can take a look at to, to see how much Zoom, <laughs> Zoom fatigue or how many hours on Zoom their teams are spending and understanding the days of the week and so forth like that and across various countries. 
but we also made this tool available to individual contributors. So anybody can see the extent of how much time they're spending on Zoom over a given amount of time. And that really kind of drove the impact of, hey, this is something I should be aware of. It's something I'm monitoring. And leaders were, were, were able to do things like this. They were able to say, we're going to put in a no Wednesday uh, uh, a meeting, no meeting Wednesday afternoon. And then we're going to look at the impact. Do those meetings spill over to the other days or do we really reduce the number of hours? And some organizations were very successful at reducing the number of hours. Some organizations, they said no meetings Wednesday, but then all of those spilled over. But the tools were at their hands. And so we didn't have to do these dashboards over and over again because we built the tools once and they're accessible for the entire organization. Another example, again, as, as some of the things that uh, we face for people analytics is how do we make um, data around diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging more transparent and accessible? And most organizations do a uh, annual global impact report. Some organizations were doing, uh, you know, kind of quarterly updates via um, their internal comms via email, or even I've seen some people posting on LinkedIn. We wanted to we wanted to really focus our employees and realize that they really want data in their hands and they want to know um, kind of our journey and whether or not we're holding ourselves accountable. So that we created the data diversity report, which is accessible to all employees in Workday. It's a Workday report. If they want to know the current status of our diversity, where we're at today, they can go in, run that report themselves. I, I tell you, at first I thought, well, I'm not sure how many employees are very interested in doing this, but you can actually see the rep report runs. And this is one of the most popular reports inside Workday. Our employees are highly committed to this topic and they wanna know, are we making real progress? And this is one of the ways that we put the data in their hands and they can see whether or not we're making real progress. Another example of um, making usable and, and relevant insights is during this entire 20 and 2021 period, we decided to switch out our um, in, uh, continuous employee listening um, system from a weekly pulse that we are doing in Workday, we call that the best Workday survey, to PECON, which is uh, for us a weekly pulse as well, but just a whole nother platform of insights. And we went through with this whole change journey where we're saying bye to best workday survey and thanking it for 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 working with us for a number of years to saying hello to uh, uh, Pecan and getting leaders excited about this um, really what they call total activation, including the employee and the employee listening uh, um, strategy, so that employees have a personal dashboard. They know how they are. Um, they know the topics they're most interested in. They see the comments that are responded from their leaders, and they get to see how they compare to their peers. And that was really, really important for employees to have a voice in this whole process. And then we were able to roll this out and extend it through our entire um, management and leadership. And I tell you, of the products you know that we have enabled and turned on, we turned this on day one for all of our uh, thousand employees. And I've never gotten so many Slack messages from managers saying, Phil, I've been waiting for three years uh, for great feedback on things I can prove in my organization. In one day, I got 600 comments on exactly what I need to do to improve it. So that's just the power of focusing on analytics. And what's important and relevant to this, to this story is it's run by a single person. So an entire employee listening thing for a big company is run by a single individual. And that's because technology allows the enablement and scale of that. So again, those are a couple of, uh, um, um, you know, I'd say products that, that have come out through, through our journey um, over the last couple of years. And just to, you know, kind of reorient on uh, what Sue is saying about the lessons that she's learned. Here's kind of three lessons that I would say I, I've learned along the way and that I would impart to other leaders is the first is around building a type of team, uh, a new, building a new type of team. So you mentioned product managers, like, 10 years ago, did you, you know, do we know what product managers were? We probably didn't. I know I, I didn't. But now there's a whole team uh, uh, here that are product managers and their whole job is to make sure that products are usable and relevant. 
And so they do what normal product managers do. They create a roadmap, they create a backlog, they work with stakeholders, they make sure there's adoption. And that's just a way that I think people and leaders have to start thinking of in order to get the scale that they're talking about. The second one is focus on personas and technology. Um, I think people analytics, we've always had a bit of technology in there. We always like to take stuff out of data, out of technology, analyze it, but really uh, pushing uh, data into technology and really leveraging the scale of technology, especially as it maps to the you know, major personas that you have. I think that is uh, something that has given us a lot of scale and something I think it give a lot of our peers a lot of scale. And lastly, and I think, you know, it will be interesting on to see how this evolves, but we've really doubled down on enablement. So it's not, it's not enough for us to build great products and make it usable. We also have to do the extra step of enablement, enablement for our HR partners, enablement for our TA partners, enablement for our frontline leaders. And enablement is enablement at scales. It's not just holding a lunch and learn, but it's also creating compelling, strong enablement with walkthroughs on how to use this accessible in your learning platform so that a manager can quickly say, hey, I need to use this. I can do a quick, short video. Now I understand how to use this. And enablement has been kind of the breakthrough for us to really drive the adoption of these products. So those are the three things. And then two, you know, you know, we had this discussion. We're both reflecting our own journeys. I'm just curious, you know, as you reflect on what we've been through, any kind of closing thoughts before we bring Al back in here, which I'm sure he's going to pepper us with a, a lot of questions. I'm sure the questions will come, so I don't really have many closing thoughts, um, but I, I think the only thing is, I think I'm looking at the people in the session, it looks like most folks are in people analytics or aspiring to be, I would just say, you know, keep fighting the good fight, um, and uh, things always change over time, and I mean, again, 10 years ago, I had no idea what the heck a product manager was, and now look at us here, so I'm curious to see what will happen in the next 10 years, so I would just say, yeah, keep going. Yeah, and I appreciate to what um, what I think is unique in people analytics is this kind of network that we have. I think uh, this connections between uh, our peers who are building this. We've been through a lot, um, and I do think you know um, uh, there are certain you know um, groups that you rely on to get help support. And so if you are getting the people analytics, you you are in people analytics. Don't be afraid to reach out to a peer in a different company. Don't be afraid to say, hey, what's going on? I know me and you have had some conversations. I kind of reached out to you on this. You're like, Phil, how, how did you enable Workday's people analytics? I said, here's how we did it. And there's just some mutual sharing. And I think it is a great community. So really lean into that community. And I believe, and, and, and spaces like what uh, Al has produced around Pafau is really given a great community for people analytics leaders. So with that. I love that. I <laughs> I shamelessly I'm gonna, steal from you and everyone, so I'm as you happy should. to help others. <laughs> well, you, you both are, are very kind. Hey, before you uh, stop, oh, actually, you, you stopped sharing. No, so. I, no it, it, it's it's all right. Um, I want to pick up on something. First off, thank you very much for the kind words. I, that it does not go unnoticed and unappreciated because uh, having been in this field for now twenty years, roughly. Um, I wouldn't have any insight or made any progress in my career, whether it be in this discipline or any others, without the help of peers. And so the more that we can collaborate, open up, be vulnerable, create new ideas, because the way forward is not going to be, OK, Workday did this, Coca-Cola did this. It's going to be a creative uh, endeavor. And we have to get the right people in the room. And you two are certainly a couple of the right people. So thanks for, for sharing. I, I want to pick up on a couple of the themes that you, you introduced. And before I do, um, and I, I want to be totally open about what we're doing here. We've been in the pandemic for 18 months, give or take. And we've been staring at screens. You talked about Zoom fatigue and we're uh, virtual conference fatigue as well. <laughs> so I'll call that out. Um, that being said, I, I want to make sure that if you have taken the time to participate 
to participate today that your specific needs are being met. So how does that happen? Well, based on some of the um, ideas that uh, Phil and Sue shared, I spun up a couple poll questions. So if you go into the poll section next to the feed, uh, you can respond to those that are very basic, uh, whether you be a consultant in a large enterprise, small business, uh, whatever your role, um, it'll be relevant to you, I would think. So please uh, contribute to those polls. I'll leave them open for a while and we'll come back to them later. And also add your questions in the feed itself. Until then, uh, I personally have some questions, unsurprisingly. Um, one is the idea of personas. And I get kind of like this when I hear, well, employee experience, you know, is a new thing. And uh, uh, and the reason I say that is back in the late 90s, a book came out called The Experience Economy. And it highlighted that many people, when they talk about share of wallet, they're allocating their budgets to get experiences that are unique. Now, fast forward, you know, that was parlayed into customer experiences and now employee experiences because how we feel as employees is going to affect how we produce, how we collaborate, how we innovate, all, all those good things. So that's a long lead up to the question, which I'll point to you, Phil, first, is you talk about persona. You know, what does that mean? How do you identify those? And lastly, why is it important, you think, beyond what you shared already? It's, uh, I wish I could say it's super complicated and there's this crazy process to do it, but I would be lying. <laughs> um, per personas for us is really uh, an, an audience who um, we can build uh, a product that would consume it and give us feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where where we didn't try to overcomplicate it. We said um, we exist at Workday to help uh, Workday make better people decisions. That's why people analytics exists. Secondly, who makes um, people decisions at Workday? And then from there, it's pretty easy. Our senior leaders make people decisions, right? Our partners are HR partners who in you know influence make people decisions and then and then from there it, it ended up pretty good and then with the persona it allows us to scale so what people decisions around talent acquisition around retention and that I'll by focusing on that instead of saying you leader need this I can say you groups of leaders who make people decisions need this type of information. Of course, we personalize, but that, that has allowed us to have scale. And so it's a bit of a pivot, I know, um, there, but it also is in the product management. You know, if you're a product manager, you absolutely have customer personas and user personas. It's the same thing in people analytics. Uh, Sue, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, with Phil, it probably sounds a lot more complicated than it is. But when you asked the question, I thought, gosh, how would I, uh, you know, explain this? And uh, I would just say, you know, it's groups of people that differ in the way that they use the information and uh, make decisions. And so I still try to think of it in, in that way, regardless of whether we're using technology or training or something else. Well, I, I want to call it out as a key theme uh, because here you are, uh, Phil, you're with a technology company. Uh, you are with a technology company that actually provides this service and you're talking about a people first approach uh, where you have to understand effectively the internal customer of the insight, what experience you wanna give them, then create the assets, create the data, the visualizations, all this stuff after the fact. I see many taking what I would call a technology first approach and not just hoping that that end customer, you know, uses it in the intended way. So, you know, Sue, going back to, you know, to Shell and throughout your experience in this field, how important is that? You know, and it, do you see enough of that kind of uh, customer first approach being taken? Um, so to your first question, how important is it? I think it's extremely, extremely important. Um, I started off as an academic and, you know, at, at the time I was like, this is very interesting. Therefore, I think everyone else uh, will be interested in it. But the reality is that is definitely not the case um, at all. And so I think making sure you know your customer or your client or your audience and um, framing uh, your projects and questions and information 
information to them. It just helps uh, helps it resonate much more, and then will help us make changes, you know, um, in the right direction. I know this sounds probably super cheesy, but a lot of us got into this work because we want to help people and you know make uh, people's lives better at work. And so making sure that we target the message to the right audiences is really important. Um, to your second question about whether we're doing it enough, um, I think we can always do more and do better of it. And so I, I would just say, you know, we can always do more. Right. And, you know, then how to do more with scarce resources and, you know, limited capacity, both technologically and, and with people, which leads into my next question, staying with you, uh, Sue, is, and we're going to talk about this a little bit with Greg Pryor in our, our next hour, but I want to get your thoughts, uh, given your experience and what's happening there at Coke in dealing with the great resignation and, you know, the oscillation, if you will, between return to workplace, going back to work and, and creating these hybrid, you know, work environments it, is this, is what... Uh, who is your like principal customer or customers plural? And do you have a governance body that brings this together? Um, because what you know HR does is going to impact facilities and vice versa, which is going to impact IT, which is going to impact operations. So you know what does that uh, governance structure you know look like? You know who, who's your principal customer group, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I. I hope no one in my company is listening to this. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I, I think the initial reaction from a lot of teams is that, um, you know, leaders, your senior leaders are your main customer. But I disagree with that. Employees are my main customer. And mm -hmm. so, you know, employees make up a majority of the company. They are the ones that are going to, you know, help change move along or slow it down and things like that. And so I would say understanding what our employees need and what they're saying and meeting those needs will ultimately help us move the business forward. Um, and so we obviously talk to our leaders to understand the strategy and what's going to move the business forward there. Um, but making sure we still have our ear to the ground and, you know, talk to regular folks, you know, real employees and understand understanding their needs, um, helping to address those, I think will ultimately help us propel the business forward. Sue, I've always uh, liked and respected you. I just, I like you and respect you even, even more. Right? <laughs> I was like, I hope it, no one's listening. No, no, I, I think it's a huge call out because, you know, when you talk about trust and transparency, here you are as a worker, you're generating all this data consciously or unconsciously. It invites the question, to what end for the sake of what and if it's just to optimize workforce spend i'm not going to feel good about it if it's going to benefit me as a worker manage my capacity ensure well-being ensure that you know i have work that's interesting to me that aligns with my skills then my propensity to generate data is of course much higher. So, you know, Phil, with that, I, I know you have done great work around well-being and creating, you know, cultures of inclusion, which obviously is a priority in all organizations uh, right now, large and small, and it should be ongoing forever. Um, so you, your, your thoughts on delivering value back to the workers who are actually generating the data? Yeah, I think, um... Uh, Sue really nailed it, and um, maybe I could just share a brief story about how important people analytics is. You know, going into the summer, there was a lot of excitement, like the pandemic is going to wind down. We're going to have some, you know, free time. People are going to, you know, have some vacations. But what we're seeing in the data was that there was this kind of general sense of continued fatigue. And uh, we really needed to ramp up the business in the later part of the year. Um, and I, I said, look, this is a, a pivotal point that we have to decide what we're going to do. And it, it came to head in a, a, a meeting with our uh, executive committee where our CEO, Anil's there and our chief people officer. I said, look, we need to fundamentally do something for the summer to help us reset going in the fall. And they, this is how much, you know, people centric, are they're like they chimed up i remember <laughs> anil getting on the video and says we are going to do something uh i guarantee it for an entire company next morning i hear we do thank you fridays so this is where we give every employee every other friday off throughout the entire summer to take time off to kind of wind down what we are doing and really reset our organization so that we're kind of 
not all working at the same time. So it's like, okay, I can take time off, but 50 other people are working and they're going to email me during this time. And that had made uh, a fundamental, I would say, reset for our organization during, during the summer period and setting up for the fall. And it speaks to the value of, of, of listening and the impact it brings back to the employees and how closely our leaders pay attention to this and want to do the right thing for the employees. So it's not just, you know, culture, eat strategy for lunch as a, you know, Peter Drucker quote that you put on a wall. It's actually something that you all as an organization respond to that is led by the insight that you're delivering leaders to take appropriate action. Is that a fair playback? Uh, yeah, exactly. I feel like I was, or we are the, the um, messenger of what, insights over what our employees need to be feel like they um, are, are happy, they're healthy, their families are taken care of, and they're productive at work. And if we could do that in a way that makes our leaders make better decisions, that's goldmine for us. Hey, I, I got a, um, a question that's a variant of what we just talked about. It, it's a bit tactical, but I'm, and I'm going to paraphrase it. it. It's this, is that I have Workday. This this um, individual has Workday in their organization, and you know why Workday people analytics versus something else. Like if you go to HR Tech, you know every other vendor has a people analytics value proposition. So arguably, it's ill defined. It's confusing. So you know, I know this is probably a shameless, shameless positioning for a sales pitch, uh, Phil, but, and it might you know, go to you, Sue, is because you mentioned you know, Workday Prism. I imagine you thought about the array of solutions that are out there, but, you know, concisely, you know, what was it about staying within the uh, Workday ecosystem uh, that was important to you? In fact, let, let's start with Sue as a uh, as response first. Uh, yeah, sure. And so we're, we're still grappling with this internally, but we probably as an organization have over 20 HR systems, and this is just HR. So we have data sitting in a lot of disparate systems. And we also have dashboards and reports that also come from all of these disparate systems. But a lot of the feedback from our users said, hey, you know, these insights are great, but I have no idea which system to go to and when and why. And so actually having one area or maybe fewer areas for people to go to to get that information, it just makes it a lot more usable. So if you can, you know, condense it to one or maybe just even a few systems, I think it's just really helpful for user experience. Thank you for that. Phil? Yeah, I think... Um for our, you know, talking about, you know, I am a customer, you know, I work for Workday, I get it, but I'm also a customer of Workday and I'm one of the harsher critics. I said, I need products that work for us to scale our company. And uh, with Workday People Analytics, one of the things that our partners really love is the, the scalability and the security it provides. Um, mm -hmm. Like many organizations, um, the access to data and detailed data and insights is governed by a security model. And that model is mapped to HR partners, TA partners, and so forth like that. And instead of you know, configuring a, a BI you know, a solution or a Tableau dashboard in which you have to redo security every single time, this allows the insights to be auto-generated across the history of that uh, um, person's organization they support and secure to their team in which if somebody gets hired to the team, it's available and accessible. So it ju just makes it super easy um, for them. And then if there's a reorg, uh, at least I'm gonna be biased here on, if there's a reorg, which always happens, um, I don't have to do any work. I do zero work. <laughs> it reorgs and there's no redoing of the tools, looking at this, now we have a new geography. It is, it's seamless. And um, the fact that it works, it provides great insights and it's connected to the security model. I, I feel that provides the scalability people analytics teams need in order to work on other research projects or other solutions. Um, and so that's the value for me. Well, well thank you, uh, Phil. And, and thank you both. Any closing comments as we uh, wrap up here? You know, I would say, uh, Ali, thank you for the great community. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you've built a great community, um, and I, through this community, get to 
to, to work with and meet people like Sue. And Sue, thank you for your partnership. I feel like I'm a better leader now, having gone through all of our discussions leading to this. So just appreciate the partnership with both of you. Yeah, th thanks, Phil. And uh, Sue, again, thank you for showing up in the way you do. I actually, I didn't give you a chance. Closing comments. No, I was just going to say thank you all for taking the time uh, to chat with me. Um, if anyone else wants to chat offline, um, please definitely feel free to reach out. I'm happy to pay it forward. Phil has helped me and lots of other folks in this space. And so I'm happy to help anyone I can. All right. Well, again, thank you both. You to be well. And hopefully, hopefully we'll do this in person before too long. So until then, uh, look forward to talking soon.